Okay. It's only 9.57. But who's counting? But who's counting? Yes. Well, everyone's here, so let's rock and roll with the subject that cannot be spoken about. Enlightenment. There's nothing to say. <laughs> we can't. <laughs> I know, yeah. So um, I am going to start with a poem. And I've read this before in some context, but I think Emily Dickinson sums this topic up beautifully. So she wrote, the soul's distinct connection with immortality is best disclosed by danger or quick calamity. As lightning on a landscape exhibits sheets of place, not yet suspected, but for flash and click and suddenness. Emily Dickinson. So I, um, took this apart a little bit, and I thought, huh, the soul's distinct connection. Soul, that's a word we don't hear much here. Soul, it's essence. So I'll let that dangle for a minute, soul. Immortality, huh. I wondered, what kind of karma is that? What kind of Enlightenment, might that be? Heaven, nirvana, an end to suffering, is best disclosed, revealed, by danger or quick calamity. And I thought about the gap in our everyday lives when something goes awry and we are struck by, whoa, I was moving along at my pace, and then something, I just got a phone call, or I got a flat tire on the highway, or my kid has to come home sick and I'm at work. There are all kinds of moments, gaps, and they're not all calamity. The gap could be a really great thing. Oh, I did get into that graduate school. But within that gap, what do we do? So is she referring to the gap with quick calamity? As lightning on a landscape exhibits sheets of place. Zap. Zap. It is lightning, snap, crack. And she says flash, click, suddenness. So I just have, had to wonder, what is, what is she referring to? So <clears throat> this topic um, has thrown me for a loop. I cannot imagine why on earth I asked Eve if I could talk about enlightenment. <laughs> really. Especially because it can't be talked about. And so what do I do for an hour? <laughs> and uh, I so wished, have wished I could channel Ruth Rankin and have one little folded up piece of notebook paper <laughs> that she didn't even refer to because she talked about her life with such passion and <coughs> dignity and generosity. And if ever I've heard a Dharma talk that's moved me, it was yours last week. Didn't need a piece of paper. Well, I have 22 sheets. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> And once I had a teacher, and I've told this story before, who, after seeing how overprepared I was for something, said to me, tear up your notes. And um, I took him really seriously, because he is, after all, my teacher. Some of you 
know who I'm referring to. <laughs> and so I was going to tear up all my notes, and I was crying. And I thought, I'll make a mandala out of the ripped up shreds. <laughs> really? And then I got an email that said, I didn't mean it literally. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> so I have my 22 pages of notes today. And within the notes um, are some pretty good snippets of poetry, not mine. Um, but doing a Dharma talk is a kind of challenge, unlike other things one could choose to do on a Sunday morning. And the months leading up to it, <laughs> you know, it's like uh, 50 minutes. So at 11 o'clock last night, uh, um, I had my 22 pages re-annotated, I might say. And I ate some cheesecake and had a slug of bourbon. And I thought, <laughs> I can't do this without visual aids. I just can't sit here without my art. So I printed some prints. So, uh, and this is the oddest art exhibition I've ever had. It looks like a science project, <laughs> really a fifth grade science project before PowerPoint was invented. Um, but I needed my visual aids, and I am going to at some point, if I get to it, talk about ego, and I thought, this is so my ego. I am so a painter, so an artist, and I cannot seem to let that go and sit here and be a wannabe Buddhist scholar, which I'm not. <laughs> so here is my art that I will talk about and use it to illustrate the points I hope to make. Um, so I also, when I do a Dharma talk, I ring subtitles in the weeks I'm preparing. So here are my subtitles for this talk. Faithful hound, true dog. A glimpse is just a glimpse. What's bliss got to do with it? Seek and you won't find, i.e. abandon hope. Not self versus no self, to be or not to be. To be here now or not to be anywhere. <laughs> what does love have to do with it? I think I was uh, channeling Tina Turner for a, <laughs> for a morning. <laughs> really enjoyed <laughs> YouTube. <laughs> one for all, all for one. Knock, knock. <laughs> knock, knock. <laughs> <laughs> no room, no view. Then there was Peggy Lee, <laughs> as I was getting toward the end of this talk, realizing I'd gone around in circles. Is that all there is? <laughs> and the Sam Cooke version of I Wish You Bluebirds in the Spring. What? <laughs> yeah. Okay, so Faithful Hound, what is that about? Well, um, I, we lost my, our beloved Obi, <coughs> Border Collie, in January, and by two weeks later, um, we were at anti-cruelty and paws in Chicago to adopt a dog. Uh, you got love, where are you going to put it? It doesn't mean that part of me isn't still grieving for Obi, but <coughs> Hart needed a dog to love. You need somebody to love, and dogs are really good. So we got this hound, and then the dilemma of what do you name a dog? We went through all kinds of options and agreed on Bodhi. Elizabeth has a car named Bodhi. <laughs> Her oldest boy is Bodhi. <laughs> right, right. So uh, that's a big, big name for a puppy who leaps through the air and causes 
blood and bruises and counter surfs and um, <laughs> and the other version of this she wrecked yesterday at five o'clock. So this was another print. Um, uh huh. Dog ate the homework. <laughs> right. Shredded the homework. So why name her Bodhi? Uh, it is awakened the way, and I think this, I do believe this dog has huge potential. It's a big name for a puppy, but, um, and I also thought about her, you know, Joe Shoes, does a dog have Buddha nature? Well, this dog is a clean slate. She doesn't have a mean bone in her body, intentionally. <laughs> um, she is curious. She views every moment of every day fresh. No history, fresh. And uh, does she have Buddha nature? Well, the answer in this case is not moo. <laughs> it's arf. <laughs> arf. Bodhi, the dog. So um, in coming around about this talk, I started with the books on the shelf. And probably my first Buddhist book was uh, Marion Mountain's Zen Environment. And then there was Beginner's Mind, and then our teacher training course filled out the library with about 20 more books. You know, and it's Dan Siegel and the Brain, and it's um, Tara Brock and Brene Brown, and uh, of course I have the Dalai Lama. I always refer to Chogyam Trungpa Rinpoche. Um, several of his books mean a lot to me because he's so clear so clear and so courageous and so simple and so complicated. So I looked up enlightenment in every of probably 40 books, including poetry, and everybody said something different. <laughs> so then I went to Google. <laughs> <laughs> What does Wikipedia say about enlighten when, enlightenment when everybody else disagrees? <laughs> I mean, there are common denominators. Enlightenment, awakening, realization. Those were three words that popped up reliably, and other things that I'll talk about also did. But um, Miriam Webster, uh, got to start, got to love her. <laughs> her? Was that a woman, by the way? Anyway, a final blessed state marked by the absence of desire or suffering. And then I thought, I don't like the word final, really. That doesn't seem appropriate. Uh, what about the word blessed? Well, I didn't like that. Who's, who's doing the blessing? Hmm. Uh, state? Hmm. Well, one of those seers, uh, actually, I think it was Charlotte Joko Beck said, enlightenment is not a state, it's a process. So I thought, OK, final blessed process marked by, I could go with marked by the absence of desire or suffering. I thought, that's not too bad. So I don't think I've ever heard the word Ken show here. Um, can, seeing, show, nature, seeing nature. But I came across the word can show several times. Um, and then there are different Buddhist schools of thought about enlightenment. But I also found something I, that I I'm going to deviate a lot because you don't get to enlightenment fast, do you? <laughs> There's no straight course. So I'm going to deviate. Uh, somewhere I read that Buddha determined four kinds of questions 
for some reason I found this interesting. The first kind of question deserved a um, qualitative answer, yes or no. Second kind of question deserved, merited, um, an analytical kind of answer, like really looking at something from various sides. Third kind of question, um, he threw back a question, merited a question. And the fourth kind, silence. So this topic of enlightenment, one finds silence. But I'm paid the big bucks to talk. So, <laughs> so why my art? Um, I've been walking in the woods every day since the third week in November, <clears throat> taking photographs. And I have hundreds and hundreds. And um, I have never liked nature. Never. Oh, I, I mean, it's not that I haven't enjoyed swimming in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, it's not that I don't see Tom's trees that I'm going to miss. I'll always think of those trees as Tom's trees. Tom helped me see nature in his photographs of that tree, those trees. But I've never spent time in nature. And part of the reason for that, I realized as a painter years ago, I'm sure you know Beardstadt's huge luminous landscapes of the Hudson River Valley. Well, this is called transcendental painting. And it's gorgeous, and I did learn a lot about color, looking at those paintings, but the view was so big. And I, I got real stubborn as a woman, and I said, I don't have time for vastness. I just don't have time for vast. I want to look at what's right here, right in front of me. So I've never been to the Grand Canyon. I think now I would really appreciate it. But... Um, a book by a woman named Naomi Shore called Reading in Detail. It was a feminist uh, take on fiber art and stitching and sewing and embroidery and so forth. And when I read that book, I thought, that's why I don't like those big, vast paintings, because intimacy is what matters to me, what's right smack dab in my hand matters. I'm a gatherer, and this got very essential, essentialist, but that's how I felt. Vast was too big for me. So walking in the woods, um, I didn't know what was going to happen. So I was practicing not knowing, for sure. So there are four spots I go to, um, not all four every day, but Thatcher Woods. So um, I'm not showing you the early ones, but I've labeled these. So those, that, those were from January. I'm not sure if with the glare you can see them, but it was cold, and it was January. And uh, no particular color except gray and white and black and brown. And I did a big series of these, and they look like calligraphic swatches. They look like ink. They were so simple and stark and beautiful. I don't mean my photographs. I mean what my camera captured. So I thought, yeah, I'm going to keep going back. You know, there's something, something happening here. So I chose these two at about 12 this morning. For uh, and I've labeled them absence of desire. They're really open and unspecific, although if you look carefully, there's a little branch asserting itself.
these, um, there was some thaw at some point. And I, so I'm using these for one of the characteristics that I did find in the books I read and the people I looked up, um, non-duality. And what's that about? Um, again, on the road to enlightenment, some realization of non-duality. That we are not separate at all. And both of these photographs illustrate separation. By the way, if you have any comments or questions as I go, um, for me, the best image of non-duality is Manjushri with the sword. Cutting, you know, cutting himself, cutting us cutting through the crap, cutting through duality. And, oh, I should say, I have, I have a companion here today. This is Fudo Mio. Uh, kind of like Manjushri, at a quick glance, Fudo Mio, wrathful deity, wrathful, has a sword. He also has a lariat in the other hand. This sword is a three-pronged vajra, wisdom. He is sitting on rock. He is called the immovable one. He's surrounded by fire that burns away delusion, illusion. He is there to help us get to enlightenment. Um, he converts anger to compassion. He has one fang pointing up and one fang pointing down. He's scary looking, but he's our friend. <laughs> so, Fudo Mio. And the lariat. The lariat. I did not read what the lariat represents. So I can't answer that. Yeah, but I'm not absolutely sure. Why he has one braid, I'm not sure. Why he is so bedecked and bejeweled, I didn't read why. Uh, there's a wonderful sculpture at the Art Institute that I photographed uh, November of 2016. I did a series of protector wrathful deities that I showed here, and Fudo Mio was one of the sculptures that I photographed for that show. Okay, the skandhas. Well, the skandhas bedeviled me when I took our teacher training class. Um, the skandhas, five skandhas, the aggregates. How many of you have taken the primer slash foundation classes? So you know that wonderful diagram of the wheel of awareness with the hub and the rim. Well, last week or so, I was still bedeviled by the skandhas. And I asked the question, does that rim, as we talk about it in the primers, refer to the skandhas? Because let's remember, on that rim, one sees body. Body, form, form. Sensation, the senses, perceptions. Now, on our diagram, we talk about relationships and emotion. And then the last one is mental formations. Not the last one, the fourth, mental formations. Um, our thoughts, our habits, so forth. Fifth one is consciousness. And we talk about consciousness being aware of the other four. Uh, I'm doing my best to explain something that's way above my head here. Um, the reason I 
liked, liked, that's not the right word. The reason I was drawn to the skandhas, the skandhas represent who we are not. I am not my body. I am not what the lilac that I'm smelling. Yes, my body is smelling that lilac, but am I the lilac? Am I my body? Am I my nose? Am I my system, olfactory system? I am not my habits, because I can change them. They change. Circumstance changes habits. Relationships. Um, and I thought, th all of these aspects that we're not, as self, are what I needed to think about so that I could begin to peel the onion of what myself isn't. I needed them. So these, this photograph I took last week, these are out of order, uh, but I was thinking about obstruction and what gets lodged in our heads that uh, deters us from maneuvering more clearly. Um, this one, I, I was thinking about uh, duality and relationship and clinging to relationship. Is this making sense? I mean, yes, no? <clears throat> By the way, in the spring photographs, I'm using filters and I'm fiddling around a lot more than shooting straight, which I was pretty much in the winter. Um, the other thing I found, not only do I like nature, but much to my amazement, I like winter. I never, ever thought I would think I like winter. But I ran over to those woods with my hiking stick so as not to fall on the ice. And I just found miracle after miracle all winter. Every day was different. Spring, well, color's happening. That's different. So um, what Buddha had to say to the monks about the skandhas, we are not, and this, this is not a direct quote, we are not our bodies, our feelings, our perceptions, our thoughts, our consciousness. He said, this is not mine. This I am not. This is not myself. Now meditate on this. So that led me to some <clears throat> thinking and reading about no self and not self. I think I have that somewhere. Maybe not. So. I was more familiar with the term no self, but I came across not self, and that made more sense to me. Because no self seemed to me to be a denial, just an absence, a wall, gone baby, gone self. Whereas not self seemed to me to reveal a consideration of the skandhas. I am not body. I am not perception, I'm not sensation, I'm not my mental formations. So I came to really prefer not self. When asked about no self, Buddha would answer, because to do so would have been to make a duality, he didn't want to answer. He advised them, the monks, to pay no attention to questions. Do I exist? Do I not exist? Because each question would lead to suffering. Joan Halifax Roshi said that the trouble with some aspiration for enlightenment is that what we need to do is deconstruct our ego which is neither God nor angel, 
And being a human being in a wider is, I mean, it is being a human being in a wider context of relationships. The thought of enlightenment, among other things, creates a lot of consumerism, including ego consumerism. So then I googled ego. <laughs> and I found a fabulous video by a French singer named Willie William. And it's titled Ego. And please go to YouTube and check this out. So it's in French, but conveniently, there was an English translation. <coughs> so Willie William is singing, Mirror, tell me who's the fairest of them all. Even if I become a megalomaniac, <laughs> come and stroke my ego. And then he says, allez, 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 go, go, go. So this is his fight within himself through this video. Let me enter your matrix, taste your delights. No one can dissuade me from it. Go, go, go. I'll do anything to accompany you, ego. I'm really one track minded. I'm fine in my bubble. Go, go, go. Mirror, what have you done with my head? Now, some transformations happening and the dancers are dancing differently in the video. This dishonest transformation is not what I asked for. The buzz is nothing but a fake. I'm no longer in the matrix. There's no longer anyone to talk to about it. Finally, I've left my bubble. Everything is rosy. Everything is beautiful. Before my ego imposes, I'm done looking at you. Go, go, go. So we do know that the ego is not solid. We want to see it in the mirror. It's not there. So Einstein came across an Albert Einstein quote. The true value of a human being is determined primarily by the measure and sense in which he has attained liberation from the self. Albert Einstein. Yeah. The true value of a human being is determined primarily by the measure and sense in which he has attained liberation from the self. So what about self-realization, self-nature? Uh, it's a paradox, isn't it? It's a, it's a tough question. What's the nature of the self? Oh, the self is supposed to not be there. And so, you know, it's like, ah. Um, Philip Kaplow said, awakening is when the conscious and the subconscious minds are emptied of all fantasy, imagery, thought forms, and blissful feelings. So, yeah. Awakening is when the conscious and subconscious minds are emptied of all fantasy, imagery, thought forms, and blissful feelings. <clears throat> so, there's that pesky word, bliss. <clears throat> and I, you know, I was thinking, have I ever experienced what I thought of either, well, in retrospect, as bliss? Certainly not on LSD. That was interesting. It was colorful. Ooh, everything was moving. I drew this winged woman whose wings were moving. <laughs> And I wrote about the end of time and the beginning of time, and she was flying on the paper, and I drew for hours and hours. I still have the drawing, so I know it really happened. But um, that wasn't bliss. For me, it was just an interesting experience um, that I don't need to have again. Being an artist is a trip. <laughs> right? <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah. Oh. <laughs> yeah, really. Yeah. Um, but <clears throat> in terms of bliss, I had two blissful experiences, both on vacation in Greece. Well, gosh, who wouldn't? <laughs> you know. <laughs> but I was, uh, I guess, 20 on Mykonos when there were just windmills, basically, and rooms in houses to stay in. And I was sitting on a cliff, and it was sunset. And I was gone. I was merged with the universe. Uh, and I thought later, that was bliss. That was blissful. Maybe that was nirvana. Well, now I know that nothing about that experience included the bodhisattva vow. That was a personal moment of bliss that was fleeting. Um, the other one happened also in Greece, same trip. My friends were going to possibly experiment with drugs, and I was foretelling the film, <laughs> uh, Midnight Express, <laughs> and, <laughs> which actually came out later, but I was not going to end up in some Greek <laughs> jail. So I took a very fast walk in Athens, and I wrote about this in my diary, and I remember it so Clearly, I was walking really fast, and the orange blossoms were blooming. And all I could do was smell those blossoms, and everything was moving. It was as though I was on drugs, but I wasn't. Everything was just flying past me, and I was part of everything. That was another, in retrospect, blissful experience. Definitely not enlightenment. It was. Uh, a vacation. <laughs> uh, I, I gotta ask you. Yeah. Please. <clears throat> I, I, I am just astounded by your last statement. Definitely not enlightenment. It was a moment of enlightenment. Forget bliss. It was a moment of enlightenment. You smelled the, you were. All you right. You smelled the orange blossoms. You were there in that moment, and that's all it was. It was, and the world was all there. And it was warm and safe. Forget. forget no, no, safe. that was part. You know, okay, fine. The warm okay, safe, okay. Warm. Thank you, Mark. All right. <laughs> no, you see, you know what I'm saying. Yes, and I agree with you. Thank you. Also, nature. Yeah, true. Yeah. Kind of. Although it was, <laughs> it that was dead in the heart of Athens. With Maybe. taxis, but I wasn't no. aware of the taxis. It was the orange blossoms. Yeah, and the, okay, all right. Okay, thank you. So, what about, I'm checking the time here, true nature. Ego, this, I chose these this morning at midnight because of the idea of the mirror. This was glass of ice in the forest preserve. Okay, true nature. Well, true nature. Trungpa wrote, of course, of the, spir uh, the spiritual warrior. And if ever, when I think of my true nature, I straighten my backbone and feel courageous, no fear, um, dignified, that's Buddha nature. Uh, I sometimes wonder if my spine becomes that sword. Buddha nature. Hmm. So two monks were traveling, and they saw a scorpion stuck on a rock. And one monk swam out to save the scorpion. And he was stung over and over again. And the other monk said, what are you doing? You're being stung. And the monk said, that's the scorpion's nature. Well, why are you doing that then? I'm saving the scorpion because that's my nature.
Leonard G. Khan Cohen, who I have to work in to any Dharma talk. <clears throat> he appeared. <laughs> what? Okay. He wrote a poem called True Self. True self, true self has no will. It's free from kill. But why I am a novice still, I do embrace with all my will the first commandment, do not kill. He was a novice. He wasn't there yet. He was still being a good student, still listening to the rules, I think, is what he was getting at there. Um, so, true nature, what I meant here in, with these two photographs was uh, sitting and really confronting the shadow. Confronting what comes up when we sit. The second photograph, and that day I was a lunatic in the forest preserve the day that <laughs> it had been, um, there had been a thaw and a sudden freeze. And I was walking along the water's edge, seeing miracle after miracle after miracle of these ice formations that looked Baroque and Rococo. And I was just saying, oh my god, oh my god, wow, wow. Wow, which I do a lot in the woods, actually. I, I hear myself say, wow, <laughs> wow. But that day, and I probably have 30 photographs, from, and I was walking right along the water's edge. And so in terms of finding true nature, confronting the rough stuff, the shadows, and peeling the onion. I picked those photographs because I think of this process as, as peeling my onion. I mean, I'm not alone in using the term peeling, but um, peeling away, peeling away, peeling layer after layer after layer. So do you get my references here? The tough stuff and then the process of continuing to peel. OK, what about the nature of the universe? And I have, I don't know if you can see those two. They're kind of blackish, goldish. Well, sometimes when I get back to the studio and I start looking at my photographs, I'm also saying, wow. I mean. I say more than that, but I'm not going to say right now. What I really say is like, holy, wow. And that day, that was very early morning. They looked like midnight, but they were very early morning photographs. And it was the way the light was hitting the ice, and the light was hitting my camera. And uh, to me, those two photographs are in my art making life, little miracles. And by that, I mean that's my own term. It's like, I don't remember doing it. I don't know how that happened. What was that? They look like alien landscapes to me somehow. Some of these I do turn upside down and sideways. Um, but I don't, I don't know how those pictures happened that day. And I love them partly for that reason they appeared. But I thought they would be pretty good in this chunk of topic about the nature of the universe. Um, when I think about that, I think, wow, can I zoom out and look at me and that pesky ego <coughs> and all of my aggregates from a distance. And what about Indra's net? And I've done a lot of paintings about Indra's net. Is Indra's net the point of view of the universe, where everything is interconnected, interdependent? Thich Nhat Hanh uses the term interbeing. 
He said he thought about <coughs> using the term together, but it just didn't, it just didn't work. So interbeing, interconnected, interdependent, co-arising, impossible without every other gem that's at every, at the vertices, is that the word? You know, a gem that reflects everything else. Is that the point of view of the universe? Seems like it could be. Some other kind of perspective. In Roshi's uh, Zen, Zen Life series, um, this idea of a triangle from the relative to the absolute to an apex, the relationship that goes back and forth. I mean, I can't explain it now. I can barely grasp it. But this idea of a triangle, and you know, I don't want to say a higher view, because higher than what sets up a dichotomy. So um, the best I can do to understand the nature of the universe is Indra's net. That's where I come back. Visualizing, you know, it's not about visualizing, but that's a tool. So um, can you see the photograph with the sun reflected in the water? That photograph was a little bit Bye, Mark and Pat. Enjoy the game. That photograph, sometimes I come up with the title for the photograph while I'm in the woods. And I should say, I, did I say? I don't think so. I post something on Instagram every day, at least one photograph. Many of them refer to what I learn here, what I study here, what I sit with here. Um, so I had just read a Dogen poem. There are two translations, and I'm going to read both of them. And I took that photograph, and I got to the parking lot, and I looked, looked at what my camera had seen, and I thought, wow, that's this poem. Windless, waveless, there in the midnight hour, an abandoned boat swamped in moonlight. Another translation. Midnight, no waves, no wind, the empty boat is flooded with moonlight. I thought, whoa, wow. That's the perfect title for that photograph. So holistic, whole, interconnected. Um, the photograph next to it, I did fiddle with a little bit with filters. It looked very spring-like and very Japanese to me. And everything was starting to dissolve and flow into each other. And the day I fiddled with enough filters to get that to happen, I thought, ah, that's it. Dissolution. You know, not rock hard, but more flux and flow. So that photograph was key. Big Bang, Small Pop is one of my subtitles. Well, I started looking up enlightenment experiences. And of course, I came to Mohammed in a cave, Cave Hira. And what to put into the Quran. Then I, of course, came across Jesus. Um, well, there was Moses in the burning bush. And the bush was aflame, but it didn't incinerate. And uh, the teaching was, take the Israelites from Egypt. Then there was Jesus, who was tempted by Satan. And I'm looking at, I hope I get this right, but there were three temptations. One had to do with material things, 
Satan said, I'll give you anything you want, Jesus. Second one had to do with, okay so far? Uh, <laughs> land, territory, something. What? Kingdom. kingdom. Oh, kingdoms. Big. Big, bigger than land, probably including palaces. <laughs> palaces, land. yes, kingdom. Power. Third one, questioning a psalm, correct? Help me out here. What? Yeah. 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 So, no deal. <laughs> no deal. What about Buddha with the Maras? You know, temptations. My daughter's name Mara. Mistake. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and then last night I thought, okay, so there's Muhammad and Buddha and Moses. And I love the painting by Caravaggio of Paul's conversion on the road to Damascus. And Caravaggio paints him on the ground, on his back, arms up. The butt of the horse is right. He's fallen off the horse and blinded by the light. So we looked up that song this morning. It was blinded by the light. I thought, Paul, Saul became Paul, blinded by the light. It's a dumb song. Do not go to YouTube. <laughs> Manford Man. Terrible song, but appropriate for this talk, blinded by the light. So I was thinking last, very late last night, well, what about women? And then I thought about Bernini's St. Teresa. The title of the sculpture is The Ecstasy of St. Teresa in a small church on a hill in Rome. And she is stabbed by hundreds of gold arrows. And art historians have argued what ecstasy means in this case. You know, is it religious conversion of some kind? Is it orgasm? There have been debates about what is Teresa experiencing here? Um, what about Mary when the angel flies in and uh, she is going to be the mother of God? This was my understanding as a painter of Annunciation images. For years, um, what is happening with her at that moment when she sees the passion of Christ, sees the sorrow? Is that a bodhisattva vow in the making fast? Let's see, where am I? So big bang, small pop, what I meant here, enlighten with, enlightenment with a capital E, where no words, dissolution, everything, nothing, form is empty, emptiness, emptiness is form. The day I found this photograph on my phone, I, that was a wow day. And I thought, what this represents could be those small moments of insight or enlightenment that we experience every day. When we peel back, it's what our Buddha nature locates, where we are, who we are. But I also thought this photograph is shamatha, one-pointed attention, peaceful dwelling, landing on a dot, coming home, counting the breath, sitting, meditating. Is that enlightenment? Well, of course it is. To sit is to be awake. We are Buddha nature. It's small. It's not, this looks like a big kind of cosmic explosion. This is this tiny little dot that landed on a branch with its reflection in the Des River. 
All right, so I came across the topic of suchness. I'm going to end soon. Suchness and eachness. And I have no right to try to talk about this, except what popped up for me immediately was Gertrude Stein. Suchness. A rose is a rose is a rose. So I looked up Gertrude Stein and found out that that's not what she originally wrote. She was writing a poem about a woman named Emily. And it was, Rose is a rose, is a rose. But then she realized, she was smart. Oh, then she switched it to a rose is a rose as a rose. And she did mean, it is as it is. And um, Trungpa said, water's wet. Water's wet. How things are, just as they are. So I was, this was the day a couple of weeks ago, the blizzardy Sunday. What to do in the forest preserve, what to see. And <clears throat> those clumps of snow were coming down and um, causing ripples. So that one I titled Enzo, Enzo, Enzo. I was thinking about breathing into a sumi ink circle. And there was one and another, and these ripples kept going and going. Uh, <clears throat> but I'm using them here because water is wet. Recognizing suchness. And what about sitting zazen? What about sitting? Those two, in fact, this one is from yesterday, and I'll tell you why. Sitting, just sitting. Whatever posture we use, spine matters, just sitting. Is that enlightenment? Yeah. So the second of the two photographs, <clears throat> We um, had a meeting here the other night, and some big emotion came up in me. And um, I will put a plug in now for a course June and I are teaching in the fall, Overcoming Obstacles for Women. So a lot welled up in me that I don't need to go into, except to say that I was thinking about differing sensibilities. This is not exactly in my book on enlightenment. But um, if awake means being with yourself in the moment, where I was the other night in a meeting was very difficult and very true. And I was very aware how different people have different sensibilities, different life experiences. I wasn't judging. So we see, if you look carefully, there are three. Here's one sensibility. This was me, twisted up in knots that night. And there's one tiny little line. That's another sensibility. OK, and then I'll finish. Um, Bodhisattva vows. Well, let me, let me read another Leonard Cohen that's beautiful, of course. A fresh spider web billowing like a spinnaker across the open window. And here he is, my little master, sailing by, wishing me luck. Admiral, I haven't finished anything in a long time. Pretty good, Leonard, huh? Henry David Thoreau. Only that day dawns to which we awaken. Only that day dawns to which we awaken. And I'm truly going to end with two more Leonards. The first. 
titled The Collapse of Zen. Remember, he spent parts of six years at Mount Baldy as a monk with the name Jikan, which means silence. The Collapse of Zen. Why should I shiver on the altar of enlightenment? Why should I want to smile forever? Leave it to Leonard. And this is probably my favorite Leonard Cohen poem, Clockwork. The crow knows exactly where to sit on the yellow bench. The wave exactly where to break. The jaw that will not unclench is fastened perfectly to the writer's skull. Future generations come like clockwork under the damp cement arches to include themselves in this well-recorded afternoon. And now it's time for me to go wash my bowls. <laughs> so, thank you. Any questions? Any comments? Oh, these. Thank you, Tony. This is where I, oh, yeah. This is where I was on Wednesday. And on Instagram, I titled it Blather. <laughs> because on Wednesday, I said, I am not doing this Dharma talk. I cannot do this Dharma talk. It's all blather. It's just all blather. These two characters are blathering, blathering, blathering. Any talk about enlightenment is just blather. I'm not going to do it. I'm going to go to the Zen Center and have a council on gender. I am not going to blather on about enlightenment. <laughs> this one was from yesterday, where I decided, just breathe. Just breathe. You can do this. You can get in the flow. Just breathe. <laughs> Back. I had two thoughts. One came up when you were talking about Zazen. Is this, is this enlightenment? And this uh, quote of a Dominican mystic, Catherine of Siena, came to mind where she said, all the way to heaven is heaven. And I thought, well, she, if she was in a different milieu, different group, she might have said, all the way to enlightenment is enlightenment. Perfect. And then I'll bring another Dominican in as yeah. we talk about Blather here. Mm -hmm. And at the end of his life, Thomas Aquinas, after writing tomes of theology, said, it's all straw. <laughs> it's all straw. Huh. Thank you. Yeah. Anybody else? Well, thank you. Thank you. <laughs>